If you are a note taker, get your pens ready because we're gonna go through a lot of scriptures, write a lot of stuff down. Young people, if you consider yourself a young person, I want you to look at me real quick. Take today serious. This is a amazing, amazing walkthrough. We're gonna go through so many different books of the Bible to understand Israel's importance and why we carry a part in that, okay? So this is very vital. I grew up never knowing. Um, I didn't understand this, I'm 32. I just now am starting to understand this. Don't wait that long, okay? Let's just go in. So Matthew 24, verse 36, this is Jesus talking. Um, Verse 36, he says, but on that day, an hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son, but the father alone. So he's talking about Jesus's return. He's saying, hey, no one really knows when he's coming back, not the angels, not even him himself, but only the father knows. Look at verse 37. For the coming of the son of man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the the day that Noah entered the ark, and they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away, so will the son, oh, so will the coming of the son of man be. Then there will be two men in the field, one will be taken, and one will be left. Two women at the grinding, at the, or will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, and one will be left. I really want you to focus in on verse 37. Everyone say 37. All right, verse 37 says this. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. Now, does this mean that God is going to flood the earth again before his return? No. He gave us the promise. He gave us the the rainbow. He's not going to flood. So he's not talking about the redemption. He's talking about the way that people were living. And and he says it's going to look just like that at the end. This is Jesus talking. He's given us a promise. He says, hey, guys. Before I return, the world is going to look as bad as they did in Noah's time. Now, what I love about about God is that there's types and shadows in Old Testament revealing what Jesus is going to do. So in the Old Covenant, the answer to sin was death. New Covenant, it's still death, but it's through the Son, Jesus. So now he doesn't have to flood the earth. He's going to actually come, and he's going to deliver us from it, okay? Um, But... Now, hold your place there, because we're going to come back, but Genesis chapter 6, verse 11. There's one scripture there. We're going to have it on the screen if you don't want to flip over. But Genesis chapter 6, verse 11. This is specifically about Noah. And this is talking about the corruption of mankind. So, So Genesis 6, verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. Someone say violence. I want you to highlight that word, underline it, write it in your notes. Because that word in the Hebrew actually means Hamas. Someone say Hamas. Now, Hamas is, it it means to treat violently to other civilizations. Now, I want you to start connecting some dots because the terrorist group called themselves Hamas. And then Jesus says, hey, You'll know it's coming close to me coming back because Hamas will be all over the world again. So that violence that, that, that God needed to send a flood to to get rid of was Hamas. Say Hamas. So Hamas is the violence um, that, that is treated towards other people. So I want us to be fully aware. Look at verse 37 of Matthew 24. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah's. Jesus is, he's like saying this, hey, when I'm getting ready to return, Hamas will be all over the world again. Um, Violence will encompass the world again, okay? And I believe that what happened last Saturday was the start of what Jesus was talking about. I don't believe it's the fulfillment. I'm definitely not preaching a doom and gloom that, hey, he's coming today. Like, I'm not gonna, that's not what I'm talking about. I want us to be aware, though, that the things that Jesus talked about, it's not a coincidence, and we can't just lay it off and be like, oh, Hamas, okay, cool. No, 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 this is actually, guys, it's happening. Okay, now, if you guys, how many of you guys have a physical Bible? Wave it at me, okay. We're gonna test your Bible knowledge. I want you to turn to Obadiah. (laughs) Obadiah, if you got an app on your phone, you can cheat, but that's okay, but Obadiah. (laughs) Obadiah. Hosea, Joel, Amos, 
than Obadiah. So it's after Psalms, about halfway through your Bible. Mine's on 854. I don't know if that helps you, but that's where mine's at. It's one chapter. Now, I don't know how many of you guys have ever gone to look at the end times in the book of Obadiah, um, but we're going to today um, because it's going to kind of, it's going to start a, uh, a, a prophetic storyline that I want to educate us all on um, of how Israel is today, why things are happening. I wish I had a big whiteboard where I could draw some stuff for you, so just mentally picture it or draw it on your own notes. But Obadiah, verse 10, there's only one chapter. It says, because of the violence to your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame and you will be cut off forever. Now, remember, what is that word violence? It's Hamas. So, in Obadiah 10, it says, because of the Hamas to your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame and you will be cut off forever. Now, Obadiah is prophesying judgment on the Edomites. Someone say Edomites. Edomites. Okay, so if you, I don't know if your Bible like has the thing, but it's talking about Edom will be, will be humbled. So he's talking to the Edomites and he's saying um, he, that the Edomites were living in Israel, Jordan, Petra, the, all these little desert areas around Israel, um, and they were showing violence to the descendants of Jacob, okay? I'm gonna get to Jacob here in a second, but in Psalms, um, it, it breaks it down a little bit more. I'm not gonna turn there, but it says that at, when the Babylonians were killing the Jews, the Edomites were rejoicing over the killings, they were rejoicing. They were excited about the tearing down of the temple and the killing of the Jews. And so Obadiah is prophesying. He's, he's like, hey, because you joined in on the violence of the killing of the descendants of Jacob, you will be covered with shame and you'll be cut off forever, okay? Um, so there's two different origins of beliefs about different religions of the world. And uh, you can write them down. You can go research them yourselves. But two of them come, one of them is Ishmael and Isaac, you guys have ever heard that, Ishmael and Isaac? So Abraham is the father of everything, and he's the father of nations. Well, he has a son out of the flesh through, um, through Hagar. And so basically God gives him a promise, says, hey, you're going to be the father of nations. And him and his wife didn't see that promise. So Sarah looks at, his, or, or at her maiden and was like, hey, you're young, you're probably able to have a baby. Why don't you go sleep with my husband so that we can fulfill the promise of God for our lives? Okay. So of course we don't see anywhere in scripture where Abraham's like, no, I better not do that. Of course he jumped at the opportunity and uh, he goes and has a baby with this maiden and, uh, and that's Ishmael. Well, he tries to offer him up to God and God denies it and says, no, that's a son of your flesh. I only want the son of my promise. And Sarah, hearing that, laughs in a tent and is like, dude, I'm 90-something years old. I'm not having a baby anytime soon. And she actually gets pregnant, and this is where Isaac comes from. Okay, so there's some beliefs that from that lineage is where the Muslim faith was originated, that we have Christians from Isaac and others from Ishmael. Um, but really, I dove in a little bit deeper, and so you have Isaac... Um, who is the son of promise, ha has a son named Jacob and another son named Esau, and they were twins. Okay, so say Jacob. I say Esau. Esau. Okay, so you've got Abraham, you got Isaac and Ishmael, and then from Isaac, you have Jacob and Esau. And uh, they were twins, and Esau, as he was being born, Jacob, in the womb, grabs Esau's heel because he wanted to be the firstborn, but he wasn't. And so Esau is born first, Jacob is born second. The, the whole story, Esau was a very hairy guy. I'm not gonna look at any of you guys, but some of you guys know, but he was very hairy and his, uh, was it Rebecca, his mom? Is that who it is? Rebecca, I think? Okay, I think. Well, anyways, it was time for Isaac to be dying. He was gonna pass over the blessing. He was going to actually pass over the covenant and, uh, and whoever he blessed would receive the firstborn promise and Jacob covered his arm um, with a bunch of, of hair, went to his father and his father blessed Jacob and Jacob received the blessing and Esau didn't. And, uh, and Esau retaliated and he got cast out. And so, so you have those two, and I believe, let me read this, this is a, a quote, but based on Christian history, many races and religion have spawned off of Esau and Jacob, particularly Muslim and Jews, and sections of each. 
Muslims have Sunni and Shia religions coming out of the Esau line, and Jacob has the Jewish, Christian, and Catholic out of his line. There have been countless wars and never-ending debates to this day over that divide. So um, I'm just going to keep going, and we'll kind of get back to Jacob here in a second, but this is important because, like I said, I wish I had a, a, a graph for you guys. So just keep picturing it. You got Abraham, and you got Isaac, and you got Jacob, okay? And then you got Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. Okay, Esau was the, he was not the covenant brother. He was, he, he got cast out. Um, so one of the descendants of Esau was Amalek. Everyone say Amalek. Okay, so now we have Amalek entering the picture. Amalek was the first person to attack Israel when they were leaving Egypt. Okay, the scripture actually says that Amalek issued Hamas towards Israel as they were leaving Egypt. Okay, um, and, and in the book of Esther, or, or sorry, so, so that's, sorry, that's Amalek. So then a descendant of Amalek, one of the most notorious ones is Haman. Everyone say Haman. Now I'm kind of just, I'm saying a lot of names right now, but I want you to just kind of see this line. Haman um, was the first person ever recorded in the Bible to want to issue complete genocide to all the Jewish people. He wanted to kill every Jew out there. This is the first recorded documented genocide of, of a people group. And this was from the lineage of Esau over the people of Jacob. So all the descendants, you got two families that are constantly fighting against each other because God blessed one and didn't bless the other, okay? Um, So this is, looking back at Obadiah 10, because of the violence, because of the the, the Hamas to your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame and you'll be cut off important. All right, that was a lot. Why is that important, okay? Everyone just take a deep breath. All right, why is that important? Because... Uh, Haman, who was, who was the one who was issuing genocide, was in Persia. Now, Persia is modern-day Iran, and Iran is the ones who are backing Hamas even right now. They're the ones issuing millions of dollars uh, of terrorist violence to, uh, towards Israel. Okay? Um, th- th- their goal is to, to wipe the sons of Jacob off the face of the map. And, uh, and, and guys, here's the reality. History is just repeating itself. We're seeing this happen again and again. Um, But what God does in the past is a picture of the future. So um, just a little bit of history. When Amalek attacked Israel, um, when they were leaving uh, Egypt, he attacked the women, children, and elderly, the stragglers of those who couldn't keep up with Israel's exit. This is what Hamas is doing right now. They're taking all the women, children, and elderly and just brutally killing them. I'm not going to go into details, but there's disgusting, horrible things that are happening right now um, to children, to babies, like, like her age, just tiny, innocent people. And I believe, that, um, I, I believe that this is not the way, okay? So let me just also say this. Amalek is not just a person, but it's a spirit. The spirit of Amalek, um, it's a spirit of oppression. It's a spirit of harm to the weak and the defenseless, and it's the genocidal spirit. So it's a spirit that actually is it's about the world right now to kill the, the, to kill the, the, the oppressed, to kill the weak, to kill the defenseless. And uh, okay, so I want you to flip over now. We're testing your Bible knowledge. So we're in Obadiah. I want you to now flip to the book of Esther. Do you guys know where the book of Esther is? So you're gonna go backwards. It's before Job. Um, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. So it's right after um, Nehemiah. But Esther and Mordecai overcame Haman, or Haman, which was, Haman, remember, Haman, let me just, while you're turning there, Haman was the one who wanted to issue genocide over all of the Jewish people. Okay, so he wanted to kill every Jew, he wanted to kill every son of Jacob, and we find ourselves in Esther uh, chapter 4, verse 15. Um, So Haman, having the Amalek spirit, wanted to have complete genocide. Okay, so the first thing that they did, I want everyone to write this down or you're gonna see it in scripture, but this is what Esther and Mordecai did to overcome Hamas or or the Amalek spirit. They they issued fasting, prayer, and intercession. Okay, so look at this, verse 15. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days 
night or day. I and my maidens will also fast in the same way. And thus I will go into the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and did just as Esther commanded him. So I want, I want us to start paying attention to how God wants his people to respond to violence. Now remember, what does Hamas mean? It means violence. Now we, as a people here in Lubbock, Texas, we're not actually gonna take up arms and go fight Hamas attacking Israel. Some of you may feel the need to, to enroll into the military and they may deploy you, but right now we're not going. But what we can do is we can look at what God does for violence because, let me say this, and not to freak anyone out, but it kind of is, America is not in Revelation. So when we actually get to the end times, the United States of America isn't gonna be around to actually have a name in the fight, which means Hamas isn't just going to be active in Israel. Hamas will be taking over and we'll start seeing it in America. Now, maybe not the actual terrorist group, but we will see violence. We will see the shedding of innocent blood. We will see women, children, and elderly brutally taken advantage of and killed, okay? So here's, the, the, God is teaching us a prophetic storyline of how to actually overcome Hamas and how to preserve a people, okay? So that's what Esther did. Esther said, hey, Mordecai, we're gonna issue a fast. I want you to intercede because I'm gonna go talk to the king. And guess what, guys? The, the finish of the story, you can go look. She pleads over the king and actually gets Haman hung. He actually ends up dying and, and all of the oppression stopped. The genocide never happened. And uh, so, all right, can I geek out with y'all for just a second? All right, how many guys uh, have a notebook? I want you to write down this specific number, 5784. I want you to write that down or think about it, okay? There is, um, the, I, when I was listening to some, some people this week, they, they brought up this year 5784. Now, 5784 is the Hebrew calendar, the year that we are actually in, so... Our Western calendar, we're in 2024. The Hebrew Jewish calendar, we're actually in year 5784. Now, here's what's interesting, okay? I'm gonna kind of geek out with you guys. Prayer occurs in the Old Testament 84 times. So we're in the 84th year, and prayer occurs 84 times. And then here's what's also interesting. The number 84 is only written one time in the New Testament. Okay, it's only written one time and it's written in Luke chapter 2, 36. So flip over there and I wanna, I wanna connect some dots for you, okay? You're like, Ben, why do, we, why do we care about this number? I believe it's prophetic through um, all of this, but Luke chapter 2, verse 36. It says, and there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of uh, Phanu Phanu Phanuel? I don't know how to say that of the tribe of Asher, she was advanced in years and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then as a widow to the age of 84, she never left the temple serving night and day with fastings and prayer. Now are you catching this? If you, if you finish the story, Anna committed her life to fasting and praying until she saw the Lord. And what's crazy is she actually saw the baby. So, so go with me on this. The answer to get rid of violence, the, the path that we need to take as Christians is not to uh, bad mouth. The, the, the goal is not to post on Facebook what your thoughts are. The goal is not to go and, and picket and riot. The answer is to pray, to fast, and to intercede. This is the answer, okay? Um, so deep prayer and fasting in God's house is vital for us. If you notice, she wasn't fasting um, or praying because the church issued a fast. So this morning, you can all take a breath. I'm not gonna make us fast um, anything today, okay? Uh, you're not gonna have to go live on water. You're not gonna do any of that. But it was a, her individual choice. She said, no, 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 I know what I can do. I may not be able to, to do physical things. I may not be able to go actually fight a war, but you know what I can do? I can fast and pray. And I believe fasting and praying is the most powerful weapon a believer has, and yet it's the most least talked about things in churches today. When was the last time you sat in a church and someone talked about fasting and praying? It's not that often. 
And yet it is the answer to get rid of violence in generations and across the globe. So um, go over to Joel chapter two. I, I, we did a Bible study, um, online Zoom Bible study this last week. Um, the video quality was super bad. Oh my gosh, it's so bad. I, I uploaded it. It'll be live this afternoon if you wanna go watch it. But Joel chapter two, verse 12, um, this has been ringing in um, Carter's ear for a while. He got it ringing in my ear and now, this, we've been talking about this I feel like for like two months and then now we're seeing it right now. Among us, but look at Joel chapter two, verse twelve. It says, Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning, and rend your heart, not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and relenting of evil. Let me just pause there. If you notice what Joel is saying, he's saying, hey, don't return to me with the latest trendy Christian t-shirt or the slogan on Facebook. He says, return to me with your heart. So can I just like pop some of you guys' bubble? You can share that thing on Facebook all day long, but God's not watching that. Oh, if you share this 10 times, God will love you. No. He's not looking at that. So if you share it, you're looking at your gain, not his, okay? He's looking for your heart. He says, I don't care what, what, what shirt you wear. I don't care about the garments. I don't care what people think about. I'm looking at your heart. And he's saying, hey, it's time to rend your heart. <laughs> Verse 14, who knows whether or not he will return and relent and leave a blessing behind him, even a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Verse 15, blow a trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Proclaim a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and the nursing infants. Let the bridegroom come out of his room and the bride out of her bridal chamber. Let the priests, the Lord's ministers, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your inheritance a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they, they among the people say, where is their God? Let me ask you all a question. How many of you guys love your alarm clock when it goes off in the morning? Anybody love their alarm clock? It's the most beautiful sound ever. How many of you guys like that? No, you don't. In fact, if I had my phone and I played certain iPhone alarm clocks, it would trigger some of you. Because you're like, dude, that same sound has been annoying me for 14 years. I'm done with that thing, right? Right here, God is issuing alarm clocks. And some of you this morning are like, man, I was not ready to come to church and talk about end times. Well, alarm clocks are set for a reason. And you can snooze an alarm clock all day long, but it's only going to hurt you in the long run. And God is issuing alarm clocks across, across the globe right now. Guys, wasn't it beautiful? How many guys got to look at the eclipse yesterday? Yeah. Wasn't it beautiful? It was awesome. But this is signs of the times where the moon will turn into blood and the, the, the sun will be covered over. These are signs. These are alarm clocks to, to start waking up and start giving the Lord our heart again. Don't, he's, he's not asking for your garments He's not asking for your cultural Christianity where it's Sunday morning, I gotta go to church and babe, make sure the roast is in the oven because at 12.05, I wanna eat. No, he's not asking for that type of faith. He's asking for, hey, will you give me your heart? And there's alarm clocks that are going on and it's saying, hey, wake up. Because here's what I hate about alarm clocks. They don't get to look at you, Emily, and say, oh, it's cold outside, she looks warm. We're just gonna wait. She's not quite ready yet. Alarm clocks don't care how you feel but they're set for an appointed time. And God is saying, hey children, I don't care where you are in your walk, we're done with the milk, you're not ready for meat, I don't care, wake up. Children of God, wake up. Hey, wake up. And he's gonna keep ringing it. My daughter has an alarm clock and we bought it on Amazon and it's the cheapest thing ever. The snooze timer is for 60 seconds. And she doesn't know how to turn it off. So at 6.30, she's throwing it in our room and it's just beep, 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 like going on. And we don't know how to turn it off. We've pulled batteries, we've unplugged it. So now we just throw it into a closet and like hopefully it dies. You know, like, I don't know. And, but this is like the, the alarms of the Lord, whether you wake up to it or not, they're gonna keep coming. We're gonna have more eclipses. We're gonna have Hamas come to America. We're gonna have people that are oppressing. We're gonna have people that are taking women, children, elders. Stuff is going to happen. And the Lord is saying, hey, another alarm. 
hey, wake up, give me your heart. Oh, I so love for you, I can protect you. I'll be with you. And he's saying all of these things, okay? So, all right, what about the New Testament? Okay, so all of that gets us up today, doom and gloom, ah, okay. I want you to flip over to Romans chapter 11. This is, this is New Testament, this is Paul teaching. Is anyone getting anything this morning? Is this good? This is a lot of, lot of teaching. I'm hoping you're kind of waking up to some stuff, but this is, now I'm gonna start looking at what we can do as Christians in America, as Gentile believers, okay? So Romans chapter 11, verse 17, we, we prayed about this on Wednesday, um, and then I'm gonna start wrapping this up, okay? Um, Romans eleven seventeen. 17, but if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive were grafted in among them, and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree. Do not be arrogant towards the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Let me help you with some understanding. What he's talking about is Gentile believers and Jewish believers. That the Jewish people were the branch and we were engrafted in as Gentile believers. Jesus came and brought us all in, okay? Verse 20, quite right, they were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. Don't be conceited. Everyone say that. Say, don't be conceited. Don't be conceited, but fear, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. If God does not spare the children of Israel, the Jews, he will not spare you either. Let me be very clear what Paul's talking about here. Verse 22, behold, then the kindness and severity of our God to those who fell, severity, but to, to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to the nature of a cultivated olive tree, how much more, someone say how much more, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Would you understand? Like, let, me, let me kind of break down what he's saying. Hey, this is, what, this is what Paul's saying. Hey, the only way that you Gentiles are even able to come in is because Israel didn't believe. So because of the goodness of God, their unbelief made a way for you. But don't get conceited because it's easier for the branch to be grafted back in of the same branch than it is for an olive tree to be brought in. What he's saying though is, is like, if their unbelief made a way for you, what will their belief do? All right, so here's what we need to do as Christians in America, okay? We're gonna start winding this down. What can we do as Christians in America? Go over to Numbers chapter six. I'm telling you, we were gonna go over a million scriptures today. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want you to hear my words. I want you to see it in the word of God. Numbers chapter six, verse 22. Some of you guys may know this song by Carrie Job, but it's more than a song. It's actually a prayer that we should be praying over Israel today. Numbers six, 22. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his sons saying, thus you shall bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. So they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel and I will bless them. How many of you guys have ever heard that song? Lord bless you and keep you. That's a beautiful song that we sing in stadiums, but really it's a prayer that we're supposed to pray over Israel. It's, it's, it's the Aaronic, Aaronic prayer and we can actually pray every day. Um, okay, so... This is the last scripture we're going to turn to. Genesis 27, verse 22. Have you ever, uh, I remember when my son was, <laughs> I feel like he still does it. Have you ever seen a kid shake up a, a can and then open it? And you know, like, oh, don't do, oh, okay, it's too late. It's just going to spew it. We'll clean it up, you know? I feel like that's what today is. I'm just going to shake the can and open it, and I pray that the Holy Spirit just, uh, you're going home and you're awakened to some of this Israel stuff, okay? But Genesis chapter 27, that we're going back to Jacob and Esau, okay? Genesis 27, verse 22. 
So Jacob came close to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, this voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. Okay, Um, Jewish rabbis, I don't know a lot about Hebrew. I don't know a lot about Jewish stuff. Over this last week, Rabbi Jason, um, he's a Messianic Jew. He does a lot of stuff with Upper Room. I've been listening to a lot of his stuff. He has like a 32-part series on YouTube, an hour long each about how Gentiles and, uh, came into the faith and what our response is with Jewish stuff. So I didn't listen to all of them, but I listened to enough. <laughs> um, but these Jewish rabbis have an interesting take on this scripture because if you know anything about Hebrew, there's no vowels in Hebrew. Now, when we translate it into English and we say it, there's actual vowels, but depending on translation, um, that, that the word voice can actually, can actually have a, a meaning that says weak. So let me say, this is another translation that rabbis say, um, and I want you to look at it. Everyone look at Genesis 22, or 27, 22, but this is another way that you can say it. When the voice of Jacob is weak, the hands of Esau are strong. Now, remember, who is Jacob? Jacob turns into Israel. God changes his name and says, hey, you're Israel now. You will be known as as God's people. Um, And and Esau is where Hamas is from. And so when the prayers of God's people are weak, the hands of Hamas is strong. When the voice of God's people is strong, the hands of Hamas is weak. So what is our responsibility to violence in Israel. What is our response to violence in America? It's through prayer and fasting. Okay? So this is how we can help. The voice of praying, the voice of proclaiming, the voice of praising, the voice of truth to make the hands of Esau weak. So if if how many of you guys everyone look around, there's a lot of babies in here right now. We all have relationships. Some of you guys came to watch these babies get baptized. If you could do nothing physically, to stop it, but you knew someone was coming to kill that baby, and you could do nothing to stop it physically, I'm sure it'd be on your every thought. And I'm not talking about your own kids, I'm talking about a, a brother or sister, or a nephew or niece, or a granddaughter. It'd be on every thought. You'd be issuing out Amber Alerts. You'd be going crazy with everything. We are as much family with the Jewish people in Israel as we are as our our own people here in America. Now, and here's why. I lied to you. I said I was gonna turn to one of the scriptures. Go to John 17. This is the last scripture. And I wanna bring weight to, um, to why it's important for us to pray over Israel. This is really where I'm at. As I was asking these questions, why do I need to pray over Israel? Why do I need, like, where is my role in this? Why is this even important? I understand like praying for people in specifics that are being murdered. I don't want anyone to be murdered. So I was praying for the Ukraine war. Um, Now I'm praying for Israel. But why is Israel important? Go to John 17. Sorry, I told you to turn there. I didn't turn there. This is Jesus talking. You guys there? You beat me there? Okay. This is John 17. From verse 13 to down to 26, this is talking about the disciples of the world and about the future glory. But specifically, I want you to look at verse 20. And this I want you to, this is going to wake you up, I believe, to a lot of things. But this is Jesus talking. He says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who believe in me through their word. Now let's pause right there. I do not ask on behalf of these alone. He was standing in front of Jewish disciples. He says, hey, I'm not asking for just the Jewish disciples alone. But I'm also asking for those, who are those he's talking about? The Gentile nations that would come to believe. He says, so I don't ask just for the Jewish disciples, but I'm also asking for the Gentile nations, look at verse 21, that they they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also might believe in us. Who is they? The Jewish disciples, the Gentile nations, so that the world may believe that you sent me. You want to know the greatest evangelism call that the world has ever seen? It will happen when Jewish believers and Gentile nations become one. Look at verse 22. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them. Who is them? Jewish disciples, Gentile nations coming together. The glory which you have been given me, I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one. 
Can I just pop your bubble if you've ever thought about the end times? Um, Jesus is not coming to crack open the sky like Marvel over New York City. He's coming to Israel. He's gonna crack the sky over there. And, and Jesus, we think the bride that he's coming back for is the American bride. But really what he's coming back for is the Israeli Jewish bride. We're engrafted in and we get part of the equation, but his heart burns for his people to turn back to him, okay? So um, can we put up the prayer for Israel um, little QR code. So everyone pull out your phone, scan this. We prayed this on Wednesday, but these are some amazing prayer points. You may have to close out of the Bible first. There you go, scan that. These are some um, Israel prayer points. Um, there's scriptures. There's actually things to pray over. Um, I hope that today just unloaded a lot of stuff for you. I hope it, it, it gave you a lot of info. I hope it, it taught you a lot of stuff. I hope you understand that Jacob and Esau, and why there's a continual battle. That, that Jacob was blessed, Esau wasn't, and now there's this continual battle going back and forth, and that Hamas is a violence that wants to spread across the globe. So we have a responsibility to rise up. Everyone's put your hand on your heart, say, I have a responsibility, have a responsibility. to pray for my brothers and sisters. If my son or daughter was actually kidnapped, I would beg you to pray for them. I'd be on my knees begging. This is, what, this is our responsibility, is maybe we're not physically connected, maybe we've never met them, but I'm telling you right now, they're as, much, they're as important to you as I am to you. I'm just a brother in the faith, but so are they. They're just a lost brother. Some of them are messianic, they actually believe in the Messiah, some don't, but he's waiting for them to come back. So, um, scan that. These are things I want you to pray daily. Like set aside time. We're in the, the thick of it. It's all over the news. It's all over your social media. Don't just be a person that scrolls past it. It's like, okay, cool. Another bomb. Okay, cool. No, like let it pierce your heart that we would begin to stand and intercede and pray for Israel. This is how Esther and Mordecai defeated Haman it's the answer, it's the Joel 2 cry that we would consecrate a fast, that we would assemble all the people together to pray. Uh, maybe inside your own circles, maybe in your family at dinner time, maybe just make a new routine that, hey, you're also gonna lift up Israel and just say, Lord, just give them peace. And start teaching your kids. Um, maybe it's a time where you are, I know, hey, I already know all of you guys have those iPhone group messages of like besties, like, and you're getting together when you're gonna go eat and you're figuring all this stuff. What if that group you started praying every once in a while? What if you send a scripture saying, hey, today we should pray? And we, this is, I just want the Holy Spirit to kind of start working some stuff in you. Um, but I, I believe strongly that um, we have a responsibility. How many of you guys feel a little bit more educated after today? Okay, good. So after everything, I, I want you to know that, that Israel has importance and they are your family, okay? That you were grafted into theirs. Can I, hey, last thing, I promise I've said that a hundred times, last thing. Jesus was not a Jewish king. He is a Jewish king. Jesus is Jewish. What do you think about that? If he was here today, he would be Jewish. I don't think he would be attending certain churches. I'm not going to mention any names. I don't even know if he'd come here. He'd probably go to the Jewish temple because he's Jewish. <laughs> so we need to not be opposed to Jews. We're brought into them. We're, we're, we're connected to them. Now, we aren't them. We're Gentile believers. We now, because of Jesus, have access to the Father. But, we, but Jesus is a Jew, okay? So I'm gonna end on that. Let me pray for y'all. Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord. Lord, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that every word that was spoken would begin to bear witness, that, you're, that you are the chief teacher, that you're the main teacher, Lord, that as we heard so much today, so many scriptures, so much history, and I pray that it would stir us to pray. It would stir us to, to have understanding that we would be able to lean in a little bit more to what's happening in, in, in the world, in our world, and what we can do to rend our hearts to you and not just our garments. That, Lord, we're not, we won't be a people that just scroll past things. We won't be a people that come to church on Sunday but live for ourselves on Monday. Let us become a people who give you our whole hearts, who join in with the sound of heaven, to agree with what you're doing here on earth. 
Lord, we pray over all of our children today that you would continue to protect them. We plead the blood of Jesus over them. No weapon formed against them will prosper, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you're keeping sickness far from our dwellings, that no flu, no cough, no anything would have to come into our, we do not receive that. We don't accept it. Lord, your blood spoke a better word. And uh, so, Lord, we live in that reality. Lord, I pray over every person in here today, Jesus, that you would be high and lifted up in their lives. I pray that you would stir hunger on the inside of them. Lord, help us turn to your scriptures to learn more about you, not just on Sundays when it's convenient, but on Tuesday mornings. On Thursday afternoons, let us seek your voice. Let us hear you clearly. Lord, break any religion or tradition that's on the inside of us. Lord, we're hungry for relationship. We don't need religion. I pray over every person today as we leave this place, Lord, we're leaving with you. We're not leaving you here. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, I love you guys. I hope that was helpful. Um, Dive in. Go read through the book of Joel. It's prophetic for this day and age. You guys have a great day. We'll see you guys on tomorrow, Wednesday or Friday. All right, adios.